for a very, very exciting uh, youth peace panel. And I must say, uh, followed by um, also exciting uh, Voice of Women AGM. And uh, I would like to now uh, turn it over to Charlotte Cheesby Coleman. She will say the land acknowledgement. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, we would like to begin our meeting today by acknowledging that wherever we may be when we join this call, we are on traditional Indigenous land. Um, as uh, Anne said, we encourage all in attendance to introduce yourself in the chat, letting us know where you're calling in from and naming the traditional nation living on that land. Um, here in Toronto, I'm on the land of the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And this is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. It's also the land of Treaty 13, the Toronto Purchase, and the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Treaty. Uh, the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, which preceded that treaty, was a sacred peace agreement be made between Indigenous nations before the Europeans arrived. It characterizes the collective responsibility we all share to each other and to Mother Earth, holding us to take only what we need to leave enough for others and to keep the dish clean. Uh, during our meeting today, we recognize the traditional wisdom of Indigenous nations, which calls on all of us to make our decisions with the next seven, seven generations firmly in mind. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I'd like to turn on, once again, hello for those who are just um, coming on and uh, a big welcome to you. And I'd like to turn this over now uh, to Anne Carver, our national coordinator, and she will introduce um, Tamara Lawrence, who will be moderating this uh, session. So over to you, Anne. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I will add my welcome as well and my gratitude in advance for the four speakers and uh, Tamara who are leading the first part of this meeting. Uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, there are two parts to this meeting. Um, we're uh, starting with this uh, keynote panel and that will wrap up around 2.22.25 or so. We'll take a break at that point and then we have our annual general meeting. Everyone, members and supporters are welcome to uh, stay for that second half. And members, we really need you to stay for that second half. For the AGM, it'll be a great review of um, the activities over the last year. And uh, people have prepared uh, reports and we'll be going over the annual report and getting acceptance of that. So that is the second part of the meeting uh, starting shortly after 2.30. Um, what else do I need to tell you? Use the chat. Uh, to message each other, to message some questions. Uh, you're doing the introductions now, which is, uh, which is great. Um, I will then turn it over to Tamara, who's going to uh, lead the guests through their uh, presentations, which I'm very eager to hear. Many of you know Tamara, Tamara Lawrence. She's a longtime member of, of uh, Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. She's been a board member in the past. She is right now senior researcher and campaigner and working closely with the two interns that we have this fall into the winter. Um, she was inspired to join VAL by Muriel Duckworth and Betty Peterson, VAL members in Nova Scotia, who I'm sure some of you at least uh, know, that's over 20 years ago. And uh, she's also a very active member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom Canada, and on the advisory committee of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, uh, World Beyond War, and the No to War, No to NATO Network. She's very connected. Some of you have been on the Zooms that she's hosted for the Peace Movement to connect, uh, um, uh, uh, do, do work together and learn together. Um, she's currently a PhD candidate at the Basili School of International Affairs at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario. So all the visible things she, you see her doing. She's also at her desk working on her PhD, which she must finish soon. Um, and she's uh, 
researching on the climate and environmental environmental impacts of the military and soon going to the COP27 uh, conference, UN conference in Egypt. So I turn over to Tamara to uh, introduce and get our panel going. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anne. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome. So I'm speaking to you from Waterloo, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and the neutral peoples of the Grand River. And uh, before I begin uh, the panel, I would like to share a few brief introductory remarks. So our panel and our AGM are taking place during a very momentous time. This month, October, is Women's History Month. And I'd like to let you know that on our VOW website is a great article that we dug up from the archives. It was written in 1987 by Kay McPherson. Some of you might remember Kay. She was the, the president of the Voice of Women at the time. And her article is entitled Persistent Voices, the, the 25 Years of the Voice of Women. And it recounts the amazing work that VOW did up until that time. And so the PDF of that article is on our website. And the article includes really incredible photos, uh, pictures of many of you uh, when you were younger and, and active with our organization. So I want to encourage you to check that out. And I'll put a link in the chat for that. And this week as well is UN Disarmament Week. Uh, last Tuesday, I was in Ottawa to attend and observe a conference put on by the military industrial complex. It was called Putting Canada on a War Footing, and they were talking about increasing military spending and buying new weapon systems. Outside, there was a big protest with a banner, cut military spending, invest in climate action, Indigenous reconciliation, health care, affordable housing. Um, and green jobs. And there was also a big banner that said stop pro profiting for war. So there is a great need for our continued campaigning on disarmament and we encourage you to get involved. And as well, this coming Monday is the 22nd anniversary of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. VA was very instrumental in the late 1990s in getting this resolution before the UN Security Council. And now we also have a resolution on uh, youth peace and security. And I would like to let you all know that VOW is very active in the Women, Peace and Security Network Canada, and we regularly meet with Canada's Ambassador for Women, Peace and Security about our concerns, and we are uh, really trying to have an influence there. So, I'm very pleased to be moderating our youth panel on peace, disarmament, and climate justice action that we need to take for a better world. We have four fantastic speakers. We're going to start with Kasha and then Sarah, Anjali, and Leah. So they will each speak for uh, 10 minutes. Some of them are going to be showing a PowerPoint presentation. And then when they're finished, we will have time for a QA and some comments. We encourage you to to put your questions and comments in the chat as they're speaking. Uh, the uh, This will go 40 minutes and then we'll have, like I said, some time for a discussion and we will wrap up the section this session in uh, 75 minutes and we're going to end it with a group photo. We're going to ask you all to stay on, uh, turn on your videos and flash the peace sign and we will take a group photo with our incredible youth activists. So I would now like to introduce Kasha, who will be our first speaker. Kasha uh, Sequoia Slavner is the founder of the Global Sunrise Project and the director and screenwriter of the multi award winning documentary, The Sunrise Storyteller. Kasha has been a photographer, entrepreneur, and social justice advocate for over a decade, as well as a writer, public speaker, and contributor to several publications, including National Geographic Learning. Kasha is a 12-time UN Youth Delegate and was selected as the first winner of, of VOW's Kim Fook Youth Peace Prize. 
In 2019, Kasha was the recipient of the Diana Award and most recently selected as one of the Wonder Grantees for Sustainability by the Sean Menendez Foundation. She is currently working on her next film entitled 1.5 Degrees of Peace that connects uh, the climate crisis with war and the need for for peace. And I was really glad to be with Kasha in Glasgow last year for COP 22nd, uh, COP 26. And I really hope that she makes it to COP 27 in Egypt so we can be together again, pushing for peace for climate justice. Kasha, uh, please take it away. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me here today. Um, so I figured that I could give a little bit of context into the film um, and also some recent experiences um, that I've had in the process of, of making the documentary. Um, so 1.5 Degrees of Peace, as mentioned, looks at the intersection between the climate crisis, conflicts, uh, and militarism. Uh, but instead of taking this kind of essay-oriented approach of breaking down the entire topic as it is very complex and will impact almost every you know impact and influence every part of the climate crisis and every part of our our future that we have to you know pivot with and, and cope and handle um i think that the lens of the personal stories of young people who are at the nexus of both issues or who are trying to build a unified movement between the disarmament and peace space and the climate justice space um, is much more relevant coming from a young filmmaker. Um, through this process, I have kind of been working in both the climate space and the peace and disarmament space to investigate where these, where these conversations are happening. Um, about the linkages between both issues. And so far what I've been learning is that um, the grassroots communities on the ground who are experiencing the impacts of both issues are very obviously aware of the impacts and the linkages. Where the siloing and where the separation of the two comes and most often is kind of in the policymaking spaces. Um, like last year at COP26, um, I went in search of the links between military emissions and the climate crisis to see if any governments were talking about regulating those kinds of emissions, were talking about the environmental damages, the humanitarian impacts. Um, and I was quite disappointed to find that those conversations were not really happening um, on the global stage. Those um, huge carbon emitters and those um, corporations and institutions that are responsible for a massive amount of environmental and social, um, sorry, my, my, the word escaped me for a minute, but those who are most responsible are not being held accountable at the table. Um, and so this year, um, in part of the process of making the film, we traveled to Stockholm Plus 50. Um, we traveled to the TPNW's meeting of states parties. And most recently, um, I was selected as one of 25 young leaders for disarmament with the United Nations Office of Disarmament. Um, and this program brought together 25 young people from 16 different countries around the world uh, to learn from each other, to learn from experts in the field, and to put together proposals for projects that we'd like to implement in our communities. Um, being in the peace and disarmament space for the past almost 10 years, I'm just starting to almost now see more young people in reflected in the spaces that I've been lucky to be invited into. Um, it has been isolating and lonely to feel like you're the only young person who cares, or you know a few here and there, but there are Zoom faces across the country. There's it's been really hard to make that in-person connection that really is the foundation of strength for this movement. Um, and getting to hear from so many young people who are active in disarmament in different, very diverse fields, um, share our ideas for how we can get more young people engaged. That was really inspiring. And to also see the intersectional approaches that they're taking. Um, among all of our projects, there was a common theme of education. Um, using education as a tool to bring young people into the movement, 
And whether that's through initiatives like an effort called Bake Not Bomb or um, guides about the military's impact on the climate crisis um, for young people. There were so many creative approaches to uh, engaging youth in peace and disarmament. Um, and so being able to build like friendships where we could share our ideas, but also our concerns and um, yeah, I guess our hopes for the way that we can continue to make change together was really impactful. Um, and I learned that, you know, young people have creative culture shifting ideas and we know how to make an impact, but that's not enough. We need equi equitable access to financial and organizational resources to not just come up with the, these ideas, but implement them uh, at the grassroots and, you know, global scale, multilateral scale. We need we need help and partnership to make those ideas a reality. Um, but I'm really encouraged by the strength in our collective vision um, and everyone's drive to make a world that is free from weapons and war. Um, and so briefly, uh, our next steps for the film, hopefully we are going to be traveling to COP27 because this year, what I've seen change is a massive shift in the amount of conversations that are taking place about these intersections. One of my col colleagues from the Leaders for Tomorrow program established a working group within the uh, UNFCCC's youth constituency, Youngo, um, on nuclear disarmament and climate change, and they have events at COP27. I know other young peace builders who are also talking about the linkages between peace building and conflict, or and the climate crisis, uh, who are also having events at COP27. So if we can get that grassroots push uh, from young people, hopefully we can get it into the official agendas. Um, and that's what I'm really interested in documenting and exploring. Um, if I can get there in time, we're still kind of figuring out the process um, of getting to COP27. But then in the new year, I'm also looking at not just the multilateral space, but young people in their communities um, and what their day-to-day -day looks like, you know, what what the joys and uh, hardships are of being a young activist trying to unify movements. Um, and so this, this past year has taught me a lot um, and I've been really privileged to work with so many inspiring young people like the ones who are gonna be speaking uh, here today. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I've been learning and more about my project. Um, and I'll share the link to the demo and the website in the chat for everybody. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kasha, for your inspiring presentation and the important work that you're doing making these connections between climate and war and militarism and the crucial need for peace and the role of youth pushing this forward. And we sure hope that you make it to Egypt because you were super effective um, in Glasgow last year and you need to be there um, at COP27 this year. So thank you for that. And our next speaker is Sarah. Uh, Sarah Rolader is, our, uh, is a second year undergraduate student at the University of British Columbia. She's also the youth coordinator for Reverse the Trend Canada about nuclear disarmament and a youth advisor for Senator Mary Lou McFedrin uh, through the Canadian Council of Young Feminists. In June, uh, Sarah attended the Nuclear Ban Week in Vienna, including the first meeting of state parties for the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the Humanitarian Conference, and the ICANN Nuclear Ban Forum. Uh, she uh, was also an intern for the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War Canada, IPP and IPPNWC this past summer, and she is a Girl Guide leader, and she is also Bao's new uh, peace campaigner. Sarah, the floor is all yours. Yeah, thank you. It's so amazing uh, to be on this panel and be here today and speaking with uh, Leah and Jolly and uh, Akasha, who are amazing uh, peace activists. Um, and so my experience in uh, disarmament and peace and climate justice has largely focused on nuclear peace and disarmament. And I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. 
There we go. And so my, uh, I've been involved in nuclear peace and disarmament for the last few years. And recently, I this past June, I went to Vienna to attend the nuclear ban week. And it was probably the most ex amazing experience so far uh, that I've had. And it was really amazing to come into this community more because like Kasha was saying, it's so very isolating being alone, especially during COVID, not being able to have events or uh, go anywhere um, and only seeing people online. And most of these rooms that you enter are full of older people who have a lot more experience uh, than us as youth. And being able to come to this space in Vienna um, at the youth orientation, uh, at the ICANN Nuclear Band Forum and all of these other events um, and seeing more youth, seeing uh, and actually being able to engage with even the adults who I've seen so many times online, it was an incredible experience. Um, and going there with Reverse the Trend and a lot of other youth that I know um, who have only met online and being able to engage with them and kind of create that community uh, within that organization alone was really impactful and it drew me back into it. And so being able to attend the youth orientation which Reverse the Trend hosted at the Irish Embassy, uh, and hearing from different organizations is kind of an orientation um, into what the week will look like, um, what they want to see out of the uh, first meeting of state parties. And I also got to meet two youth from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, interact with them and what the this TPNW, what this movement means to them um, as people who from communities who have been impacted already by nuclear weapons, um, as well as hearing from survivors and youth from uh, the Pacific Islands where so much nuclear testing has been done uh, was really impactful and it kind of made the movement more real because it's so easy here in Canada to just think of it as a maybe a eventuality. It's not real enough, I don't think. It's, it's hard to put it into reality when it's something that seems so impossible, but being there at this movement, hearing people who have experienced the devastating impacts already from it um, was really motivating. And being at the ICANN Nuclear Bound Forum in particular, I think was the highlight of my week because hearing from civil society and feeling this empowerment and being able to attend so many different events focusing on climate change, on uh, the intersections of race and gender and climate change, um, and seeing how they all interconnect and hearing from politicians, from lawmakers, uh, from activists who have all been such a huge part of this mo movement already um, made me see how many different aspects of it as well there are and how many more engage engaging aspects I can uh, partake in. And with uh, Senator Mary Lou McFedrin, who had an event at the ICANN Nuclear Ban Forum, uh, she asked us to stand up in front of her while she was speaking with signs that said, where is Canada, to send a message to our Canadian government, um, asking them where they were, because they could have sent people to the uh, first meeting of state parties for the TPNW, but they didn't. They sent people to the humanitarian conference, but not to the TPNW. And it really shows where the priorities lie. Um, the fact that they had people in the building who could very easily have attended, um, but chose not to, uh, even though us Canadians were there, but we were missing our government. It was really saddening, especially seeing the huge impact that the TPNW is having and the huge motivation by so many different nations to see this treaty succeed and the large amount of consensus um, that we saw at the TPNW uh, was amazing. And knowing that our government chose not to partake in this incredible um, treaty was <laughs> really sad. Um, but hearing and seeing uh, all of this and being able to engage with all these intersecting um, points for nuclear weapons. Uh, I chose this picture of uh, nuclear war is bad for kittens, um, which I saw at the ICANN Nuclear Bound Forum because it really brought in a different aspect of it. You know, this 
nuclear weapons aren't just bad for us as people, they're bad for our environment, they're bad for our animals. If you have a pet, there's a chance, there's probably a pretty good chance they won't survive a nuclear blast. And just these connections that we make with other animals, other, our environment, it's so devastating the impact that we as humans, as animals on this planet can have on every other living creature. I mean, it really drew in that intersection um, and hearing about the disproportionate impact that nuclear weapons have on uh, women um, about the where what states choose to do nuclear testing, choose to dump their nuclear fuel, to choose to do uranium mining. Uh, and the impact that race has on that is <laughs> another huge impact, um, huge aspect that a lot of the time we don't hear about as much, uh, which we very much should, especially here in Canada with uranium mining. Um, and for me, coming out of all of these experiences, a huge part was wanting to bring all of these different voices I'm hearing back to Canada, back to Canadian youth uh, who have, as Kasia said, largely been absent from these uh, conversations. Uh, and so with my internship with IPPNWC, I was able to create a webinar series, a series of uh, four different presentations uh, to help raise awareness about these issues to youth, uh, focusing on uh, a general nuclear education 101, uh, the intersection of climate change, gender and nuclear weapons, uh, the humanitarian impacts, as well as Canada's uh, part in nuclear weapons um, and their development. And so, bringing all these to youth and trying to uh, bring these voices and these opinions to classrooms uh, through these series has been a large part of my work. Um, and one that I have been trying to continue with also other aspects of disarmament movement and peace and climate justice through the Canadian Voices of Women for Peace. Um, and that has been amazing. Uh, I've been working largely with Tamara on uh, the F-35 uh, fighter jets and trying to stop the government from purchasing that because that's a huge expense that we don't need uh, to make that we can spend so much of that money on other areas which would be so much uh, better benefited from that. Um, as well as using social media to raise awareness about different events um, and these issues as well as uh, trying to host webinars with other organizations to uh, bring these voices uh, from those movements to uh, people here in Canada. And that has been a large part of my work. Um, and that's where I'll leave it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your very moving uh, presentation and for sharing those great pictures. Uh, what an incredible experience and learning opportunity that you had in Vienna. Just totally amazing. And I'm so glad that you could share it with us. And just to let everybody know, uh, for September 27th, which is the International Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons, Sarah, on behalf of VOW, uh, wrote a letter to the Prime Minister calling on the federal government to sign and ratify the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and show leadership for nuclear disarmament. So we're grateful for that work. So thanks very much, Sarah. And our next uh, speaker is Anjali Rao. She is a third year student at the University of Toronto. She's studying economics, peace, conflict and justice studies. Uh, Anjali is an advocate for peace and human rights with a particular attention to gender equality, education, and the environment. She is currently the president of the on-campus chapter of Love 146, an organization dedicated to ending child trafficking and exploitation. And we are very lucky that Anjali is uh, VOW's new student or intern. Anjali, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Angeli Rao. Um, I am a student peace intern with VOW uh, for this semester. Um, I'm a little bit newer to the movement than um, a lot of the speakers here, but um, I'm here to be inspired and uh, I'm truly motivated um, uh, about the cause of disarmament in Canada. 
So um, I've prepared a little presentation about what disar disarmament in Canada means to me, um, based on what I've learned working with Tamara and Sarah. And um, I'm so excited uh, to meet all of you and I hope that we can work together to make real change. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen really quickly. Um, Uh, can you all see my presentation? Um, yeah, we yeah. can see it. Thanks, Anjali. Okay, great. Um, so thanks to Kasha and Zara for sharing their incredible work. Um, I found those presentations incredibly inspiring and um, uh, I really hope that events like uh, what you witnessed in Vienna keep happening, Sarah. Um, so yeah. Uh, my name is Anjali. I'm a third year student at the University of Toronto and I'm studying um, peace, conflict and justice. Um, I'm uh, really motivated to consider the role of uh, gender and the environment in our fight for peace. Um, I was really inspired by the works of Cynthia M. Lowe and um, hearing Ray Aitchison talk at uh, my school. So um, that's a little bit about why I'm here today um, and uh, I'm excited to learn. Um, so firstly, I thought I'd talk about um, uh, what I've uh, gathered about the history of uh, disarmament and Canada's relationship to nuclear weapons. Um, so internationally, the use, development, proliferation, and possession of nuclear weapons is totally illegal, um, according to a number of international authorities. Um, the Geneva Protocol, um, established in 1977, uh, considers all attacks on civilians and attacks on the environment to be um, a, in violation of international law. And additionally, the International Court of Justice has concluded that the use or threat of nuclear weapons would generally be contrary to the rules of international law. So appreciating, obviously, the human impact and the environmental impact of implementing nuclear weapons, it's completely unfathomable that um, in Canada's past, we've allowed um, nuclear weapons to be stored on our land um, and that we've uh, signed on to uh, international contracts and uh, agreements that allow for the proliferation of violence in nuclear weapons. Um, so in the 1950s, Canada allowed the US to station nuclear weapons on its land, putting Canadians and innumerable civilians at risk um, in uh, a violation of indigenous people's rights to the use of their own land and against the wishes of many Canadians who wish for uh, a peaceful world. Um, so that to me is a very infuriating stance for our government and our military to take. Um, so in response to that, in, the 19, in 1960, VOW was founded to unite women against nuclear weapons during the Cold War. Um, and I've been reading about the incredible women that um, came together to found the organization, including um, the physicist Ursula Franklin and uh, uh, Teresa Casgrain and the activist Grace Hartman. Um, these were all uh, women who didn't see any uh, personal gain out of um, uh, showing up and uh, attending movements that put the uh, need to stop nuclear weapons during the Cold War in the face of the government. Um, and I think that their work is so powerful today when we consider um, how all of the uh, the powers of the world uh, are wielding their nuclear threats and juggling their um, their power in the international community in different ways. Um, uh, I think that they saw a future where it's not only necessary to stop nuclear proliferation, but it is uh, so crucial to create international peace through diplomacy and intersectionality and development. Um, and uh, that, that uh, understanding of the origin of VOW really helped me um, get to grips with what we do here today. Um, so today, Canada remains a member of NATO, uh, an organization that is fundamentally opposed to disarmament and supports the United States in many of their efforts to continue militarism and uh, continue uh, to brandish nuclear weapons um, against the rest of the international community. Um, and I find that, uh, a piece of information that's personally extremely worrisome and uh, threatening to my way of life as nuclear war would um, absolutely uh, destroy the world, the environment that we live in and the society that we've helped create. Um, 
So that's why uh, I think that the work that organizations like VAL, WILPF, IPPNW, ICANN, and many other national and international organizations um, that gather like-minded activists against militarization are so important today um, as we see uh, war breaking out all over the world in Ukraine and in the Middle East and uh, in South America, the, the proliferation of violence. Um, no, wrong direction. Um, so what does feminist peace look like? Well, to me, feminist peace has the end goal of preventing all violence and total disarmament. Um, so uh, in the international space, the prevention of violence obviously means um, reducing political frictions between countries and uh, stopping all outbreaks of violence, both civilly and between countries. Um, so the way that we can do that is by uh, strengthening the institutions that create diplomacy and negotiations and uh, work to stop the undermining of uh, uh, international institutions. Um, so that means that supporting uh, gatherings like the the UN um, Disarmament Committee um, uh, are so important so that we can uh, bring back power to the spoken word instead of uh, defaulting back to um, the outbreak of violence. Um, uh, uh, another aspect that is incredibly uh, important to creating solid negotiations is intersectionality and uh, maintaining equality and respect for all members of our society. Um, with particular attention to the demands of indigenous people, women, and peoples of color. Um, right now, obviously, uh, indigenous people in Canada do not have uh, uh, the scale of a voice that they need um, in governments to talk about um, the issues that affect them on the land that they own. Um, and uh, issues such as uh, uranium mining and um, the storage of nuclear weapons or the creation of nuclear energy plants um, directly affect the people whose land we've stolen. Um, and it's so important to include them in our uh, fight for disarmament. Um, and lastly, uh, we are all gathered here today to pursue the end of total disarmament and the end of militarism in favor of stronger social services and constructive government. Um, today, it seems strange to suggest a country without military, but um, around the world initiatives have existed that eliminate the need for uh, a violent force or uh, any sort of um, restrictive uh, forces from the government. Um, in Costa Rica, the military has been abolished in for favor of small law enforcement forces and the budget that would go towards the military has been diverted towards security, uh, education and culture. Um, it's our responsibility to change global norms so that policies such as this become more commonplace and we can all uh, live in a uh, society where the causes to war are removed instead of trying to treat war with more violence. Um, uh, yeah. So where we are now. Today, Canada has yet to sign the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and remains a member of NATO, therefore supporting the potential use of nuclear weapons. Um, this is in direct opposition to what we at BOW um, stand for, uh, and it is our mission to make sure that Canada ratifies this treaty and takes on board the fact that nuclear weapons are completely unacceptable um, in their uh, conception and in their use. Um, secondly, climate spending versus de defense spending. Um, Canada is ranked 13th in the world uh, for defense spending, while still struggling to reach Paris Agreement targets, specifically falling behind on climate spending. As we approach COP27, um, it's so important that we look at our budgets and we see that um, in the last five years, defense spending has uh, increased at a level that is so much faster than our climate spending. Although we've uh, seen so many um, climate tragedies strike in Canada and around the world. Just now, um, the effects of Hurricane Fiona um, devastated the uh, eastern coast of Canada and floods in Pakistan have led to mass displacement and death. Um, if you look at the numbers, the amount of climate refugees that will um, be created in the next 10 years vastly outpaced the number of um, uh, military targets that we value. So it's our uh, it's in our greatest uh, personal interest to, to stop uh, defense spending in favor of climate spending to mitigate the effects of those 
developments. Um, and as Sarah said, um, the F-35 fighter jets are uh, an initiative that Canada, the Canadian government has taken on to spend around $19 billion on the purchase of new fighter jets. Um, these jets uh, have the ability to cause great civilian damage as well as could be used in the deployment of nuclear weapons. Um, and obviously that is just completely unacceptable to us. So in our work as campaign interns, um, Sarah and I, under the leadership of uh, Tamara, have uh, been working to um, attack these issues specifically through uh, a variety of different actions and uh, methods. And hopefully we can make real change on these issues uh, before it's too late. So I just wanted to finish with um, why I joined Val. Um, VOW is an organization with an extremely long history, specifically in Canada, um, and it's a um, mission that has always included um, all the voices of people that are not included in government um, systemically. Um, so uh, I really felt that uh, my views aligned with uh, the views of this organization, and I'd love to learn more and to be able to contribute to um, the cause in any way that I can. Can. So thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of the movement and allowing me to speak today. Um, uh, I hope we can make real change going forward. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Anjali, for that excellent and, for, uh, and informative presentation. Um, it was wonderful to hear all that you've been learning uh, from your time with uh, the Voice of Women. And just to, to remind everybody that Anjali is getting credit for her internship with our organization and also to let you know that both Anjali and Sarah are working on parliamentary e-petitions right now. Anjali is working on one calling for a reduction of military spending and greater investment on uh, climate action and climate finance and, um, and Sarah is working on a petition to cancel the F-35 contract. So hopefully those petitions will be finalized soon and they will be introduced into uh, the parliament by, uh, will be open for signature uh, to all of you and then introduced into the, to the house by a member of parliament. So we're working on those. So I wanted to just let you know that those will be uh, coming along soon, ways for you to get involved. And our final speaker is Leah Halla. Leah is a passionate feminist disarmament activist living in Montreal. She works as the executive co coordinator of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War Canada. And she is finishing her final year, very busy in physics, political science and behavioral science at McGill. She is one of 25 United Nations disarmament leaders for tomorrow and was a delegate with the IPPNW um, and ICANN at the first meeting of the parties uh, to the TPNW in Vienna, along with Sarah. And Leah loves listening to music, hiking, and meeting new people who care about peace and disarmament. And I'll also add that I got to know Leah um, about, I think, six years ago when I spoke at her high school in Esquimalt on Vancouver Island. And it's really fantastic that she is involved with the peace movement and connected to our organization. Leah, take it away. Thank you so much, Tamara. Um, actually, that's I'm gonna talk about that too soon. Uh, and I'll, I'll never stop saying thanks to you and uh, Mary Wynn and, and Jonathan and a couple others for, for introducing this material to me and bringing me into these spaces and movements. Um, I'm really, really excited to be here with all of you guys today uh, and so many people I've worked with and so many friends um, and speaking alongside uh, these three wonderful women. Um, I'm coming from the unceded territory of the Gunahaga people in Montreal, Canada. Um, and yeah, over the past couple of years, I've been really, really grateful to be introduced to the world of peace and disarmament and that so many of you put time and attention into investing in education programs, um, bringing it to high schools, bringing it to students, youth like me, that's that's why so much of my, that's really shaped my past six years. So um, thank you guys. Um, 
for my for like what I want to talk with you all about today I um went through like since since high school I've been keeping these notebooks of every um like peace webinar and and lecture and group I'm a part of of all the ideas and I was uh just skimming through them and thinking about like what's the biggest thing I've taken away as a young person um or just a person and, and a student um in these movements and uh, what's like the biggest like lesson that I've I've learned um and a lot of it was from this year um and uh the T at the TPNW uh with Sarah Kasha and Marnie and at the uh in, in New York a couple uh, like a week ago with Kasha um and that is that uh building connections leads to critic progression um so connections in in many different ways connections um between movements between ideas connections between generations and connections like on a really personal level um so I just want to like sh share some of that with with you all um so first of all between movements um so I think we're all pretty aware that threats to humanity climate change nuclear weapons war hate and injustice they transcend borders and they set, transcend the categorical boundaries we we tend to put them in um, taking racial just injustice and increasing mi militarism, for instance, um, racial hierarchies have been created by and sustained through violence. And conversely, the tools and uh, the tools in the industry of violence is sustained by racial hierarchies, like Canada using or having used um, indigenous lands for weapon training and testing. And as Sarah mentioned, the mining of materials, um, the the weapons industry relies on racial hierarchy and is justified by by racial hierarchy investing in the in in violence in a legitimate way whether it's guns or bombs requires some other someone to be dehumanized in order to um, justify putting resources into into violence um so so you can't really like separate racism from from armament increasing they're they're one in the same and really really similar parallels go for climate injustice, uh, both with, with militarization and, and um, racial injustice and feminist justice. Um, when, when threats to humanity or our health and our planet don't exist in neat categories or silent silos, the solutions can't either. Um, our solutions also need to transcend borders and boundaries um, and our work as feminist disarmament advocates must be informed by cl climate and racial and class perspectives um that can be like really I mean on a personal le level overwhelming you know there's so much so much to deal with but um it's also really really motivating because if you look at the people showing up for Black Lives Matter if you look at the people showing up for for climate justice you look at the people showing up for women marches there are so many people working towards um who, who want the world to be a better place and working towards it. So we need to make sure that we're building those connections between movements and creating that dialogue um, to, to work together. Because what we all want is the same thing. We want to eliminate, uh, extent, uh, eliminate existential threats and we all want to work towards building, um, building structures and systems that prioritize people and health, the health of our planet um, instead of profit and power. Um, and there's millions of us working together. So working for it, um, we just gotta make sure we're, we're working for it together. Uh, and part of that is what I'm what I'm learning is asking um, who's being left out of this conversation, who's being left out of these spaces that we're creating, um, and what are things we can ensure in, in what are things we can do to ensure that these voices are brought to the table. Um, and this is something that like in the peace and security movement also look like often looks like youth it's youth people it's like uh youth individuals being left out of these spaces so um i applaud vow i applaud i i, I like really applaud vow for like putting so much effort and in investing in youth right now creating opportunities um for sarah and anjali and and um yeah for 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 doing this work um so that brings the next thing uh building connections between generations. Um, yeah, like we are a lot of like young people today, we have the energy and drive to to make the world, um, to like make the world better. The same, same as you, you all here to, to you all here today, but but we need to work with you. 
Um, and it's not a matter of uh, being passed a baton. It's a matter of building bridges. It's not, it's not on us. We, we, we need you too. We need to work together to do this. Um, and for disarmament specifically, I think that starts with education. Um, as Tamara mentioned, I like I was brought here, like I was first introduced to this world when when Tamara came to my high school and like invested her time into doing a workshop. Um, and then Tamara brought me to a moving screening where I met David Monk and Mary Wynn. Um, and then I was having tea at, regularly at Mary Wynn's house and my whole life changed. Um, but uh, but the the I, I just want to going back again, like the the educate investing in education of youth is so 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 crucial to putting disarmament specifically on the agenda um we can't be a part of these dialogues we can't be a part of these spaces if we don't know what disarmament is and 15 16 feels embarrassingly late to have to have learned that word learned about that struct learned about why it's important and what those structures are and had had Vow not come and done that workshop in my high school, I, I don't know that I would have. Um, it, like if, if, I, if I would now know, know what disarmament is. Um, in New York, I asked a room with quite a few young people in it to put up their hand um, if they'd been in high school in the past couple of decades and then keep their hand up if they learned about uh, being in, um, learned about disarmament while they were in high school. And every single person put their hand down. Um, because it's not a part of any structural institution to learn about peace. It's not a part of any structural institution to learn about how, how we can make change. Um, so it's just really, really, really crucial that that education part, that like that educational work um, at a young age is, is, um, is happening. And, and uh, I guess like the next part after that, after, after the words are given, after the, the vocabulary to engage in this conversation is introduced, um, would be empowerment and inclusion, but not inclusion as in like, you know, it's not about adding mix. You can't just like add youth and mix. It's not a, it's not a simple like add and stir. If you bringing new perspectives into a space is about um, also allowing for just deforming, uh, allow not deforming. Um, it's, it's not expecting them to conform and like allowing spaces for new perspectives as well. So being careful. Um, and this is something like I found when when uh, running workshops this summer for primary age primary aged um, students is you know making sure that I wasn't uh, teaching so that they'd repeat what I say, but actually actually like inviting them into this space to listen to their perspectives, not inviting them in, into the space to amplify amplify um, what I already believe. So just being really, really, really conscientious that building bridges as equals and working together. Um, because yeah, it's not it's not on any generation. It's not on yours. It's not on ours. It's on like we. In order for change to be realized, um, we need to work together between movements and between generations, um, and work like focus on the commonality, commonality, and the goal that we all want, that millions and millions of people want. And if we can channel, if we can channel that, like change will happen. Um, and then the very last kind of uh, the last last thing I put over here as a, a big takeaway is building connections between each other. Um, I think that the interpersonal building friendships and making sure you're also taking the time to ask how are you and to get to know the people you're working with is so, so, so crucial to sustaining yourself in these spaces and working to make change. Um, and I put some moments here that uh, I know were really, really impactful for me. So over here is a photo that is not at all in a policy room, not on a webinar, um, but I had the opportunity to grab dinner with uh, Sarah and Kasha for the first time after seeing them on Zooms many, 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 many times, as well as Rojali, who I'm sure many of you know. Um, and I think it's just so, so, so important to also make sure that you're doing things that sustain you with other people um, because it also motivates you to keep coming back to these spaces. Um, and I know I know for me in high school, that looks like after after a day of high school every once in a while, Mary Wynn would come invite me over to her house to, 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 to share ideas or to just for, just for tea. And that was whether it's, what's a, whether it's a mentorship connection, whether it's a friend um, or whether it's just a, how are you at the beginning of a meeting, which feels rarer on Zoom calls. Um, I think that's just so, so, so important. And 
one of one of my biggest takeaways. Um, I guess like I wanted to the last last kind of perspective changing thing that I was reminded of in Vienna um, was by a keynote speaker who uh, started his his speech by asking, uh, "Has anybody given much thought to uh, the Roman Empire lately? Like hands up." And and no one put their hands up. Uh, Austro-Hungarian hands up. And I, I similarly, I don't see any hands up. Um, and he reminded me that uh, change. Um, no one thinks it's going to happen, but when it happens, it happens rapidly, and it happens all the time. It's not naive to think change is possible. Change is inevitable. Um, but activists shape what that looks like. Um, and responsible, the, the responsible civil society has saved the world so many times. Like we don't, we don't, we we are here today because of civil society. I know I'm here today because of you all, specifically like the women on this call, but then also also more more literally in in a bigger sense. Um, here and able to get my education here because of because of the work of uh, the giants behind me that that have done so much to make to make this world um, what it is. Um, so. Yeah, it's it's easy to be like overwhelmed by by when looking at the flaws of institutions, but also we have stronger institutions to work through, to make change happen through than we ever have before. Um, centuries of architecture created by like led by women um, before us, and and so many powerful people now working towards continuing um, to create change through that architecture. That architecture being uh, the United Nations systems, the D women's peace and security agenda, the youth peace and security agenda, um, the TPNW, which really really puts into practice a lot of these ideas that I was saying, um, puts into practice intersectionality by bringing in margin marginalized and frontline community into the policy space, by bringing in youth into the policy space. Um, and like a, a lot of these people are, are, uh, are in, the, in the pictures on the, on the top one, on the top, top there of the slide, if you can see that. Um, yeah, so, so I guess like together, um, if we work between movements, if we work between, if we, we put a really conscious effort into make sure we're building bridges with other movements and building bridges with other generations and, and uh, like sustaining ourselves through connections with each other, um, I'm really, really, really confident that we will never um, accept a world that cannot be changed, but rather work together um, to change everything in the world we can't accept. Um, and that's, that's, that's it. <laughs> Awesome presentation, Leah. Thank you so much for sharing your photos and your insights about being involved in the peace movement. And you are so right about the importance of building uh, intergener intergenerational bridges. That's exactly what our task is. So I hope everyone that this um, this youth panel uh, has inspired you to to make comments and to ask some questions so we have about 13 minutes or so for a q a period and um, what we're going to do is if you would like to just raise your hand now we'll take about three questions or comments at a time and then we'll have the speakers uh, the panelists um, respond to them so would anybody like to raise their hand and make a comment? I can scroll through the the chat to see if there are any uh, questions there. Uh, don't be shy. Would you like to to, Tamara, to raise your hand? Your hand. Tamara, I'm on the phone. It's Judy Berlin in Montreal. Uh, Judy, please uh, please go ahead. Right now. Yes, you you are welcome to give to to make your comment or ask a question now and Thank then you. others Very... please put up your your hands thanks Th thanks Tamara this is I guess in the nature of an intergenerational bridge uh, one of those because I think back to the Brundtland Commission report of the late 80s uh, which and I would like to remind us all its title was it's com uh, our common future and that commission r named the three uh issues that major issues the world was facing and which were 
in their estimation, disarmament, development, and the environment. And they also made the point that unless we tackle the problems around, we cannot realistically expect to tackle the problems around any one of those issues if we don't at the same time tackle the problems around the other two because they are so inextricably linked. Now, I've heard a lot today in this discussion about the link between militarism and climate change, but I have not heard, I don't recall hearing, the link between militarism and the development part. And we used to talk, and and it This comes into the spending matter, too, because the contrast between spending on militarism, spending on climate change, but also spending on overseas development assistance, that is because we talked about the sources, the root causes of conflict. Well, it's the development part of the spending, the help to the the parts of the world that need to, you know, to be to be to be strengthened, that that will address the root helps to address some of the root causes. So I think we should not forget to mention uh, the need for for development spending too. And I would like to know. We used to say the UN standard for development uh, used to be 0.4 percent of GDP, 0.4, so less than half a percent of your GDP. And Canada never in the past came up to even that standard. I don't know if that's still what the UN goal is, but I would like to know what the total between our overseas development aid and our climate change spending compared to our military is. And I'm willing to bet that the military outspends those other two things combined. So that's my comment. Let's not forget about when we're making the link with climate change and militarism, let's not forget the um, development part of the equation as well. Uh, Thanks, Judy. I see uh, Ruth's hand is up. We're gonna take uh, two more questions or comments and then we'll turn the floor over to the panelists. Ruth, please go ahead. Ruth, you just have to unmute yourself and then you can make a, oh, there we go. Okay, I just, um, it's Ruth Green from Hamilton and I'm just doing a Remembrance Day for Peace in the Westall Village. And um, I'm looking for uh, any ideas or uh, input speakers. If anybody is in Hamilton listening in today, I'm looking for the voices of youth all ages actually, but I would like some young person to come and speak um, about uh, how do we create peace in the world? How do we be peace? And it's all related to climate change and militarism and it's all tied in, I see. And um, so, uh, yeah. So I don't know whether we can connect. I'm on here to try and connect with other peace groups. And um, because I think we need to, for strength, we need to join together and not be separate from each other. So I'm part of a white poppy group, but I'm interested in anybody that speaks out for peace. Thank you, Ruth, for that. And if you could put your contact information in the chat, like your email address, we can follow up with you on your request. I think it would be fantastic for you to have a youth speaker. Is there anyone else who would like to share to um, share a reflection on what the panelists presented on asking a question? We have uh, still a little bit of time yet. Oh, Ronnie, I see that your hand up. Please go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. My, uh, I was just shocked when I heard, uh, I don't remember which one of you said that uh, Canada is 13th in the world in military spending. I, I hadn't heard that before and it's just overwhelming. But what I do with that kind of information, I usually, whenever we're in these uh, seminars and webinars and where they're talking about housing and healthcare and all the issues, 
they never ever connect it to the military spending. And, and I always say, you know, you're looking for money. Where, where can you look for money? And look at all that money being spent on fighter jets. And, and they often think I'm, I feel like they think I'm coming from outer space or something because I'm bringing up something that isn't ever talked about. None of the political parties ever, ever talk about military spending in, in the context of uh, right now, in, in any context, but especially now with all this inflation talk. And it's like everything is in a silo. And, and I really believe that what, like what Tasha's doing in her film is really important to connect these, um, I mean, the, the issue of, of military spending and and peace. I mean, they're obviously very strongly connected. I mean, if we're spending money on weapons, and, and the other thing that shocked me was that uh, conference that somebody told us was happening about Canada, or I think you said it, Tamara, about militarization, that Canada is, is um, what was it called? Something about fighting. I, I couldn't believe that they actually had a conference called uh, that title because it's so obviously, uh, you know, Canada is is gearing up to become one of these, uh, whatever they're called, <laughs> one of these uh, outrageous uh, spending uh, on military spending. Anyway, my, my my English is getting poorer as I go along, <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. But I, I think these thought, these ideas are really, really crucial. We have to raise them at any opportunity, and even if we're considered to be sort of a bit of a, you know, bit of a, a eccentric, let's say. And thanks to everyone who, who presented. It was really great. Uh uh, thank you for that, Ronnie. And I see that there are uh, two uh, comments in the chat that I would just like to bring to the panelists' attention. And that is um, one from Tony that says, glad to hear the links between war and militarism and climate destruction. Domestic, domestically, folks should also be organizing against the police on the grassroots community level. And then uh, Sandy uh, mentioned that even today, nuclear weapons could be in Canada. Yesterday, a U.S. aircraft carrier entered the Halifax Harbor, along with many other naval frigates from several countries. The U.S. will not confirm or deny the existence of nuclear weapons on foreign ships coming into our domestic um, ports. So uh, thank you for that. So there's a, a number of comments and questions. So I'll just... Uh, I will just um, go in in order. I will ask each panelist to reflect on that or share any uh, final comments, and then we will close. So I will start with uh, Kasha, if you have any reflections for the next minute or two. Thank you. Um, I, can't, I can't say that I have um, much expertise on the uh, prison industrial complex, although I do agree with the idea of abolishing um, and incorporating it into our, our peace and disarmament movement. Um, I will, I, I think for now, I'm just going to pass it on to my other panelists. And if I have further reflections, I will type them in the chat. Okay, uh, thank you, Kasha. And then we'll move it on to Sarah. Sarah, if you have anything that you would like to respond to. Yeah, so I don't have uh, a response to um, the same question as Kasha had, um, but I can touch more on um, military spending um, in terms of many people never even uh, think of it. And um, also looking at the fighter jets and just seeing how much more is spent on military spending um, than women's uh, places in and women's development and well, not development, but um, role in government and just um, support for women in positions um, in government as well as uh, other organizations and just seeing the disparity there, especially with um, recent uh, complications in our military with um, sexual assault allegations and just the willing of our government to spend so much money on these um, 
these departments that are already having huge issues with this, um, despite having other uh, departments that could very much use this money to spend on actually providing development, actually building up our country, um, providing more equality, um, but completely ignoring that, um, including ignoring climate change and um, working towards our actual international commitments and goals um, to helping with climate change and um, the Paris Accords and all these agreements that they've already made. Um, and then even going um, against the NPT uh, in a way by investing um, or choosing to invest in these nuclear or fighter jets that also can carry nuclear weapons um, going against one of the articles in the NPT. Um, and this disregard for particular um, commitments that they've already made is very telling um, with their military spending and what they're willing to invest in and what they're willing to not invest in. Thanks, Sarah. So, um, uh, Anjali and then Leah, any final reactions or response? Um, I don't have anything specific to say, but I did want to talk about the development piece um, again. Uh, so in my classes, I've been reading a lot of the um, civil war mitigation literature, um, and the link between poverty and the outbreak of civil war is just so undeniable. And the ways that um, we can stop frictions between um, community members from outbreaking into violence is sometimes so simple, um, such as like, uh, creating safe walkways for children to go to school um, in uh, Mexico and South America where um, gang violence is prevalent. Um, that just does so much for long-term effects of raising income levels and then ultimately stopping um, enrollment in uh, gangs and the outbreak of violence. So removing the nuclear piece for a bit um, in our quest for peace, it's so important that we look at the underlying causes of conflict and we uh, think about how we can make small but impactful changes. Um, yeah. Thanks, Anjali and Leah. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I wanted to touch on the uh, development. Somebody, somebody mentioned development at the beginning. I think that's so um, crucial as well. Uh, I know like in Vienna, one of my conversations that I was having a lot with um, Kasha and some, some other folks uh, were about how like the silos exist not only between like issues and ages, but also between regions. And we often don't think about like, okay, so there's all these arms exports. What what are the impacts of that the arms that we're exporting on those communities? How is that related to climate change? How's um how's that related to development? Um, and how even when we're putting money into development, um, where we're, you know, we're putting money into these programs to take arms out of communities and then giving ourselves a pat at the back at the same time, we're putting more arms into the communities. Um, so also like the, the link between militarism and development, especially in the small arms and light weapons trade um, is super, super important and uh, breaking down the silos between regions of, okay, so Canadian militarism, what's the impact on the rest of the world and development? Um, it, I, I think that's like, super super important um and i'm glad that you highlighted that we didn't that we didn't uh talk about it um and yeah i'd be super interested to see more ways we can integrate um integrate uh internationalism and and go beyond canada within our activism in canada um and then the other like on on the opposite note uh on police and um police and prison systems um i I, I think it was like Cynthia Enloe who did a study on um, militarization in society. So just like the amount of uh, like, I think it was specifically the amount of guns in a society impacting the amount of violence against women um, as an indicator and how the more militarized a society was, the more likely there was to be violence against women. And then um, someone else did a study, like a part of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, did a study on um, the likelihood of a country to go to war with another country can be a um, predicted best by like not democracy, 
not um, not its military spending, but by the security of women in that in that country. And those were two super interesting findings that I think linked the connections between um, like culture of violence on an individual societal level um, and foreign policy and like and, and like likelihood to promote violent foreign policy. Um, and those linkages, I think, like just intuitively, I think must be tied to um, police in a community um, and the militarization, the use of force of police in a community, because because all of these normatively are about how societies relate to violence. Um, so if anyone has literature on that and like more clear linkages between um, mil like uh, uh, militarization on a local level and forms like legitimate violence on a local and national level in like police systems and uh, legitimization of violence and foreign policy, the military, like I'd, I'd be super interested to read more on that. I'm, I'm not an expert on that, but it's something that I think is so important. And I'm glad whoever it was left that, left, like, I'm really glad you left that convict. Was it Sandy? Um, but yeah, if anyone has more readings, please send them my way. Um, and lastly, uh, we have two, like two, there were two um, peace interns for IPB and WC from Hamilton. So I will happily put my email in the chat and put you in touch with them if there's in-person events for the November Hamilton um, peace stuff. Uh, thank you, Leah. I see that Kasha has her hand up, and I know that we need to wrap up this present, uh, this panel. I just would like to let everybody know that we have been in touch with Ray Atchison, who is the director of WILPS Reaching Critical Will, and she and they just published a book called uh, Abolish. It's a, about the abolition of state violence from the police to the military and to NATO. And so we're hoping for a book launch uh, sometime in early December. So I wanted to let you know that we are trying to make those links. It is very important. And then just also I will put in the chat a link to the report from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute that shows that Canada is ranked 13th highest in the world for military spending. We spend about $33 billion annually on the military, which is about five to six times more than we spend on overseas de development assistance and climate financing combined. And it's planning to increase by another 70% over the next uh, five years. So Kasha, the very final word and then we have to take our picture and turn the floor over to Anne. Um, yeah, just briefly wanted to build off of uh, some of the points that Leah, Leah was saying and kind of uh, connect it back to the intersection with climate change. Um, I think it's clear with our military, military spending globally that governments are uh, not just with military spending, but governments are continuing to invest in systems mm -hmm of violence or systemic violence and whether that's through weapons of war or a lack of mitigation and adaptation funding or a loss and damage funding for those who are most impacted by the climate crisis um, or funding the prison industrial complex um, violence against the planet and violence against people is overfunded and often passed off as a form of security um, so thinking of what human security looks like and what safety for our planet truly looks like. Um, it's not spending all of this money on militarization. Um, so yeah, that's my last comment. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Kasha. So please join me in uh, giving a round of, our, our, uh, of applause to our fantastic uh, youth uh, panelists. That was just awesome. And this is a reminder to everybody about the importance in you know, engaging and empowering youth, uh, going to speak at schools, including youth in delegations, and then helping to fund uh, youth in the work that they're that they're doing. Um, and just to, to, to remind you that we've only got, Vow only has a Sarah for uh, for about six months, we would love to be able to engage more youth. So your donation and membership to Avow helps us to bring in youth into our work. So be sure uh, to support the important work that we're doing. So we're going I'm in awe. It's fantastic, amazing, inspiring, very, very thoughtful, deeply uh, moving presentation. 
Um, I can, I feel like it's, it's, it's you young people, young women who can restore our trust in the future. I, 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 I truly, truly feel that. Uh, I, I feel that uh, you are giving the, the pathway to um, sustainable peace, to a vibrant planet, and most of all, to um, educating uh, all of us. Um, I have to, I, I think Anne Green, uh, I, I like what she said, join together and not separate. And I think that has been your message. So just thank you so much. And as well, I would love to just hug everyone. <laughs> and, um, and I know that at, at another time, yes, <laughs> I like Anun. Um, we, we will perhaps pass this time of pandemics and so on and have an opportunity to meet in person. Um, that, that is um, one of my um, regrets that once again, um, regrettably, we have to rely on Zoom. And it, it may be not that it's entirely uh, inclusive to some people who may not be able to be on Zoom. So just recognizing that. And finally, a big, big, big hug to Tamara, um, who unfailingly is, I, 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 I don't know how she finds that energy. I really don't. I've been on, on some, yes, um, on webinars, on presentations, and above all, this, whenever there is, um, an opportunity to disrupt. Hooray, hooray to tomorrow for disruptions. <laughs> it's amazing. So thank you so much.